So welcome everyone to this book launch for Laura Rattray's wonderful new book, Edith Wharton and Genre Beyond Fiction. My name is Alice Kelly and I'm the Communications and Events Officer here at the Rothermere American Institute. It's my pleasure to introduce and chair our event today, a celebration of Dr. Laura Rattray's fascinating new book, uh, Edith Wharton and Genre Beyond Fiction, which came out this summer. We're really pleased to be able to bring together an international group of Wharton experts to talk about Laura's book. Edith Wharton and Genre opens up to us the many sides of Edith Wharton's writings beyond her novels, demonstrating to us her versatility and skill across an enormous range of genres and enabling us to see for the first time the full range of her ability. As Laura says in her introduction, it is often in the genres for which she is least known that Wharton is shown as her boldest, most adventurous and most radical. Needless to say, the book also demonstrates Laura Rattray's own enormous versatility and skill as a scholar and writer, as trying to wrestle with the enormous amount of material Wharton produced is a feat in itself. And Laura has based this study not just on the published work, but also on extensive archival research. So we're here to celebrate this book being published today and to assess its impact on the field of Wharton studies and beyond. So I'll now introduce our panel. Dr. Laura Rattray is reader in American literature at the University of Glasgow. Hi, Laura. Her work on Edith Wharton includes Edith Wharton in Context, the unpublished writings of Edith Wharton, an edition of the novel Summer, and with Jennifer Haytock, the new Edith Wharton studies. In 2016, she, called, she caused what I think I can call a media sensation when she published, along with Mary Chinnery, a previously unknown play by Edith Wharton, The Shadow of a Doubt, which has now been staged on Broadway, I think. Laura is currently director of the Andrew Hook Center for American Studies at Glasgow, and she set up and runs the very successful seminar series, Transatlantic Literary Women. She was recently elected to the British Association for American Studies Executive Committee, and she is currently working with Susan Burrell on, on an edition of letters from Wharton to Bernard and Mary Berenson for Yale University Press. So on our panel, we have Emily Orlando, who is Professor of English and the E. Gerald Corrigan Chair in the Humanities and Social Sciences at Fairfield University in Connecticut. Hi, Emily. She has published on 19th and 20th century literature and visual culture, especially Edith, Edith Wharton, Oscar Wilde, Nella Larson and Elizabeth Siddle. Orlando is the editor, sorry, the author of Edith Wharton and the Visual Arts. And with Meredith Goldsmith, she edited Edith Wharton and Cosmopolitanism. She is a past president of the Edith Wharton Society, and she is currently editing the Bloomsbury Handbook to Edith Wharton. Uh, Emily curated the Edith Wharton installation for Chicago, Chicago's American Writers Museum, which focuses on the age of innocence. Uh, I'll now introduce Julie Olin Amantorf, who is a professor of English at Lemoyne College. Hi. She is the author of Edith Wharton, Willacatha and the Place of Culture, and Edith Wharton's Writings from the Great War. In addition, she has published over 25 articles, including essays in Edith Wharton in Context and um, Edith Wharton's The Custom of the Country, a reassessment, both edited by Laura Rattray, essays also in Willacatha and Modern Cultures, and the Henry James Review. She is a member of the Board of Governors of the Willacatha Foundation and a past president of the Edith Wharton Society. Jennifer Haytock is Professor of English at SUNY Brockport. Here's Jennifer. And the Edith Wharton Society Vice President. Among other works, she's published Edith Wharton, The Conversations of Literary Modernism and co-edited with Laura Rattray, The New Edith Wharton Studies. She's the volume editor for the complete works of Edith Wharton, volume 24, The Children. And she's also one of SUNY's 2019 winners of the Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Scholarship. So you can see we have an absolutely stellar panel today. We're really pleased to bring together this discussion at the REI. And I'll now invite Dr. Laura Rattray to join us and she will give a brief overview of the book before we hear some responses from our three panelists. To our audience members, many of you, um, many of you here with us today, please do feel free to put questions in the Q&A box at the bottom right hand of your screen, and our panel will try to answer as many of those questions as we can in the second half of this session. So welcome everyone and over to Laura. Thank you so much, Alice. What a lovely introduction. And thank you, Julie, Jennifer, Emily, 
and the Rothermere American Institute. It's a privilege to have the chance to talk about my book here and especially to be part of a conversation with some of the leading international Wharton scholars whose work I, I most admire. And thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it when we all know there are many Zoom happenings at the moment. So to kick things off, I was asked to give a brief overview of my book. And I thought I'd start at the end. When Wharton died in August 1937, her obituaries mourned a novelist, a noted novelist, a great novelist, one of the greatest novelists even, but a novelist, which is an important part but only part of the story. Of the 43 books Wharton publishes during her lifetime, a third fall outside the categories of novel, novella, or short stories. And when it comes to Edith Wharton, that's a lot of work. Go into the archives, go into the archives, which believe me, I did, and include the numerous other texts uncollected, some unpublished, some unfinished, and it equates to an even greater volume of work. And this book, Edith Wharton and Genre, Beyond Fiction, is about all of that other work. Wharton, after all, one of the most versatile writers of her lifetime, a gifted, prolific poet, a controversial playwright, a trailblazing travel writer, a hugely influential writer in the fields of architecture and design, an innovative literary critic, a writer who overturned the conventional hierarchies of modern autobiography. And these other genres didn't represent Wharton dabbling. They weren't momentary sidesteps, brief diversions from what has long been regarded as Wharton's primary role as a novelist, and to a certain extent as a short story writer. Each was pursued fully, wholeheartedly, and spoke to Wharton's very sense of herself as an artist and to her connected, cohesive vision of artistry and art. Wharton was a writer who loathed shortcuts. And the genres nourished and supported each other. And for all of her flaws, the less familiar genres are really where we see the writer at her boldest, most adventurous, subversive, and yes, downright radical. Poetry. Her work as a poet, woefully neglected. Um, she's a prolific poet, publishing three collections of poetry in her lifetime and scores and scores of individual poems. At the Lily Archive, there's a notebook stuffed with almost 60 poems, almost all unpublished, and dating from the late 1880s, early 1890s. So a period of her career where we still have less information than we would like. And in that poetry, we can see Wharton's range and ease across a broad spectrum of forms and themes, her dramatic monologues, which in turn speaks to her playwriting prowess, often upturn the status quo. Women speak, men are silenced, the woman claims the account of her life. There's the volume of poetry verses published when she's only 16, which if critics mention it at all, it's only to dismiss it, but a remarkable range of work again there. And I think we also have the clues to her, her genesis as a writer in, in, that, in that collection. And it's also a really good reminder that the writer we often still think of as a late starter was in fact a child prodigy. So her openness and flexibility across the poetic form often defying traditional expectations. And so much more of her work than we've acknowledged is about the poor and the dispossessed. And we see that clearly in some of these genres. Um, the poetry, for example, um, a poem about a child who kills himself um, when he's locked up, um, a poem about a late, um, one of the late Irish famines, the rose, a poem about a homeless woman who can't feed her children. Cynthia, a poem about a child prostitute. Cynthia, not even her real name, we never find out. And that poem rips to shreds male sanctimony and middle-class respectability. 
and it doesn't end with a female corpse. When people talk about Ethan Frome being one of the rare steps down the social scale for Wharton, there's so much evidence to suggest that, particularly in her early career, it's actually a rare step up. Of many things Wharton is, she's also a writer of the poor. Plays, which Alice very kindly mentioned, Wharton interested in playwriting from beginning to end of her career. And all the evidence suggests that at the turn of the century, she was as probably more interested in being a playwright than a novelist. Who would have thought? And her ease in this genre spans deft comedies of manners to grittier realities of unprivileged lives. And that recent resurfacing of her 1901 play, The Shadow of a Doubt, on which I worked with my brilliant colleague, Mary Chinnery, really shows us what Morton could do as a playwright. And it's been really exciting to see the professional readings of the play and the BBC Radio 4 full adaptation. And Wharton was a controversial writer. In 1901 alone, she places the contentious topic of euthanasia right at the heart of her play, The Shadow of a Doubt, and has the Catholic press in uproar at the blasphemy of her dramatic monologue, Margaret of Cortona, which sees the editor of Harper's Magazine swiftly backing down and issuing a public apology. Wharton, well, she's not backing down, and she goes on to include the poem in her collection, Artemis the Acteon, without removing the offending passages. And I know my colleagues today will be covering some of the other genres. So I'll just say here, in her travel writing, studies of architecture and design, in her critical writings, Wharton's often a trailblazer, assured, authoritative, professional. She refuses to downplay her knowledge and expertise. In her life writings, we see her challenging the conventional hierarchies of importance of modern autobiography. In her critical writing, she would hate the term feminism, but just look at her taking to task male writers for their sexism, for their pitiful female creations. And though there's discussion of Wharton at times as being anti-women, she's subjected throughout her career to much fiercer, more pernicious levels of sexism than we've been willing to acknowledge. Nowhere more so than in the reception of her innovative volume, The Writing of Fiction. So how is it that Edith Wharton, even when admired, has been reduced at times to this rather safe, conventional, stately grand dame figure, the writer of the elite, the violet and old lace image as Wharton herself described it? Redirect the spotlight to some of these less familiar genres and we really see the bold, experimental, versatile, controversial, radical, Edith Wharton coming to the fore. Thank you. And I'm now going to pass over to my esteemed colleague, um, Dr. Emily Orlando. Over to you, Emily. First, thank you so much, Alice and the RAI. And thank you, Laura, for writing this book and for the lovely introduction and basically for the honor to be with all of you today. It has been a great joy to see this book unfold from Dr. Laura Rattray's 2016 keynote talk at the Washington DC Conference of the Edith Wharton Society. I had the pleasure to read an advanced copy of this book and to crystallize in 75 words or less the book's contribution. I called it game changing, let me explain. This is a book that will change the landscape of Edith Wharton studies as we know it. I'll borrow from Edith Wharton herself in a backward glance and call this quote, a book that needed doing. To put it another way, I think Edith Wharton has been waiting for somebody to write it and there's no scholar better suited to the task than Laura Rattray. Let me offer at least six reasons why we need this book. First, it's hard to believe that a comprehensive study of Edith Wharton's work in genres beyond the fiction for which we best know her has not yet been done. Second, Wharton's traction in popular culture is arguably stronger than ever as evident in such Wharton-inspired TV narratives as Downton Abbey, Sex and the City, 
Gossip Girl, Sofia Coppola's much anticipated The Custom of the Country, and Julian Fellows's forthcoming Gilded Age. Third, this very week marks the centenary of the Age of Innocence. 2020 is yielding a steady stream of books on Wharton's achievements across many genres that promise to draw new readers to her work. Fourth, Wharton continues to acquire new devotees by way of the Mount, the historic home she initially designed with the architect Ogden Codman Jr. as they were collaborating on the decoration of houses and which in recent years has become a year round cultural venue. And finally, Many of us find ourselves reimagining our domestic spaces as the pandemic has us sheltering in place. Wharton's under acknowledged achievements in interior design and architecture to which Rattray devotes her fifth chapter speak to us perhaps more than ever before. So Rattray's book sets out to tell, quote, the stories of these other Edith Whartons born through her extraordinary dexterity across a wide range of genres again, beyond the fiction for which we know her, and their impact on our understanding of her career. Wharton's command of, quote, a range of genres spoke to this author's confidence and sense of authority on the one hand, and to her vision of artistic cohesion and connectedness on the other. Rattray reminds us that, quote, here was a writer who loathed any kind of shortcut, and I would say the same of Laura Rattray. And while Rattray notes that Wharton may not be the first writer we think of when we hear the terms experimentalist or modernist, Rattray proves that, quote, it's often in the genres for which she's least well known that Wharton is shown at her boldest, most adventurous, and most radical, which in part explains why a full recognition of those characteristics of her work has been obscured. In her nonfiction, Rattray argues, quote, Wharton is able to find a space for and a reward uh, and to reward the individual adventure which escaped Charity Royale to suggest guiding rules but encourage flexibility within them. Edith Wharton and genre begins with a study of what Rattray rightly calls, quote, two of the most critically neglected Wharton genres, poetry and playwriting, quote, endeavoring to establish the primacy of both to a full appreciation and understanding of the writer's oeuvre and artistic development. I would argue that no one has done as much as Rattray to showcase and legitimize Wharton's impact um, in the field of drama. To me, it's more evidence to suggest Wharton's kinship with Oscar Wilde, that other impeccably dressed master of the one-line zinger. And with Irene Goldman Price, Rattray has done an enormous service to celebrate Wharton's work in poetry. Quote, recognition of Wharton as a significant poet of the late 19th and early 20th centuries and of the impact of the genre on a fuller understanding of her as a writer and thinker are both long overdue. Rattray also tackles Wharton's fraught relationship to feminism. Quote, displays of sexism, Rattray argues, reach a new degree of intensity in responses to a number of the genres with which Wharton is less often identified. Quote, in her writing on architecture and design, observes Rattray, Wharton was expected but refused to produce the chatty work her editors wanted on Italian villas to play the supporting role to a male collaborator she resisted and to adapt her ideas in a way her collaborator was not. As Rattray notes with Italian villas and their gardens, Wharton, quote, found her seriousness, professionalism, and authority under attack due, as Rattray shows us, to a, quote, decided gender bias. Now to counter the inaccurate reading of Wharton as somehow anti-women, Rattray offers this, quote, while she is memorialized as a writer who chose the company of men, it is often forgotten that she was also surrounded by brilliant women from Anna Ballman to Vernon Lee and so many others in person or via avid correspondence, some of the women famous in their own right, but others whose brilliance was obscured. Although Rattray cites evidence that would quote, publicly undercut the myth that Wharton had no women friends, the, mil the myth built Nevertheless, reaching its apotheosis half a century later in the 1986 New York Times headline, quote, 
the woman who hated women. And a headline that I might add is cringe inducing to anyone in the know. More fully than anyone else, Rattray shows us that, quote, it is often the genres outside the novel, novella, short story, in texts both published and unpublished that display most clearly an unfettered, unapologetic feminism, which in turn likely feeds the heightened responses of sexism in relation to the published work under discussion. Quoting Rattray again in her writings on travel, on architecture and design, as well as in her literary criticism, Warden is assured, authoritative, professional, and she declines to apologize for her knowledge and expertise. Rattray makes an important disclaimer regarding Wharton's writings on architecture and design. Quote, Wharton's work in this field is not entirely original, but its scholarship and authority underpinned by immaculate research elevated American public discourse on interior design and architecture to another level. In reality, Rattray demonstrates the decoration of houses was less innovative per se than beautifully timed. Rattray studies Wharton's under-examined writings on architecture and design, including, for example, her newspaper articles. As scholars across a variety of disciplines know well, Edith Wharton's The Decoration of Houses, co-written with Ogden Codman Jr., set out to save American domestic architecture from what they wonderfully called, quote, the hopeless quagmire of vulgarity and wrongness into which it had wandered. So in closing, all scholars and friends of Edith Wharton owe a great debt to Laura Rattray for unveiling a new Edith Wharton and for retiring once and for all the outmoded portrait of a lady novelist, that is the anti-feminist, old-fashioned, conservative, grand dame, poor man's Henry James, and replacing it with a more faithful rendering of the confident, consummate master of so many genres beyond the fiction for which she was once best known. Thank you, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Julie Allen Amantor. Hi, thank you very much, Emily. Um, I'm so pleased and honored to be here today. And I thank Alice Kelly and Laura Rattray for the opportunity to talk about Laura's new book. Um, this truly important book, I'm gonna be echoing Emily a little bit here, um, offers both a new big picture look at Wharton and it also investigates nooks and crannies of research that had somehow eluded earlier scholars. It's a book which really enriches and deepens our understanding of Wharton and her works. One of Laura's greatest insights is that, as she writes, Wharton is often radical, subversive, and transgressive, particularly in the early work and particularly in the work beyond fiction. Although I think this insight will also lead us back to the often overlooked radical nature of much of Wharton's fiction itself. As I have very limited time today, I'll be focusing on the more clearly feminist Wharton who emerges in Laura, Laura's book and relatedly on the anti-feminist nature of much of the treatment of Wharton's important work and especially her work as a literary critic. As Laura argues, Wharton's other than fiction texts display, quote, most clearly an unfettered, unapologetic feminism, end quote. Um, Wharton's early poem, Cynthia, which, which Laura mentioned briefly before, is a narrative poem describing a girl rescued from prostitution and made respectable but not respectable enough for her guardian son to marry. As Laura astutely points out, Cynthia is ultimately a pawn in a man's power game, something the young Wharton not only saw clearly, but cared enough about to convey in a beautifully crafted five-page poem. Other early Wharton works, including her plays, not only articulate her awareness of sexual double standards, but call her readers' attention to systemic sexism. Clearly, Wharton was familiar with the unfair treatment to which women, including women writers, were subjected. Um, early in her career, as Laura documents, and, and uh, Emily was just mentioning this too, when Laura, when, excuse me, when Wharton was writing Italian villas in their gardens, her publisher asked her to tone down her text to something more chatty in order to better accompany the beautiful but decidedly non-technical illustrations provided by Maxfield Parrish. Women as authors were to be charmingly conversational, not learned, 
they especially were not to outshine their male collaborators. This gender bias was even clearer when Wharton published Italian backgrounds. One critic berated Wharton for defeminizing herself, as he said, and commented that the book was not that of a woman, but merely of the art antiquarian, apparently a desiccated and sexless being. Damned if you do, damned if you don't, was the order of the day for a woman of Wharton's intelligence. Faulted for lacking femininity in this instance, in another, she was faulted for not being able to come up to the presumed standard of masculine intelligence with reviewers of her poetry criticizing her work for being a pale imitation of better known male authors like Robert Browning. As Laura deftly and devastatingly argues, nowhere is this phenomenon clearer than in the treatment of Wharton's literary criticism. In this field, as Laura memorably puts it, Wharton was perceived to be as much a trespasser on male literary territory as Virginia Woolf's narrator crossing an Oxbridge college lawn in her famous treatise, A Room of One's Own. Laura's book offers a superbly convincing argument about the importance of Wharton's main opus as a critic, the 1925 volume, The Writing of Fiction, while also analyzing the widespread dismissal of it by male and female critics, both contemporary and current, largely on the basis of its authored sex. At the time of publication, Laura points out, the volume was repeatedly compared to a 1921 book by the now nearly forgotten Percy Lubbock. In contrast to Lubbock's volume, Wharton's book was, as Laura notes, literally belittled, referred to in reviews as a little book, a little volume, a little study, and even a slight and scrappy. If Italian villas was judged too authoritative and masculine, the writing of fiction was judged too diminutive, too feminine. All of, all of this in spite of the works almost breathtakingly authoritative opening overview of the history of the novel, which history Laura incisively points out begins with Wharton naming a woman author, the Madame de Lafayette, as the originator of the modern novel. Laura also draws much needed attention to Wharton's voice as a critic. Although Wharton uniformly used the pronoun he to refer to the author, her critical voice, as Laura argues, is decidedly gendered at crucial moments. Wharton pushed back against portraits of women as angels in the house, preferring, for instance, George Eliot's materialistic female characters like Rosamond Vincy in Middlemarch and Gwendolyn Harleth in Daniel Deronda to her pieces of faultlessness like Mira in Daniel Deronda. Equally, Wharton res resisted idealized portrait of women penned by male authors. Wharton's critiques of authors like Walter Scott and Maurice Hewlett are both incisive and hilarious, as Laura's excerpt show. For instance, Wharton mocks Walter Scott's women as keepsake insipidity, insipidities, excuse me, I'll try that again, keepsake insipidities, while her critique of Hewlett's heroines displays her spiky wit in Laura's phrase, with Wharton noting that one of Hewlett's female characters starts out thin to emaciation, but morphs into the much more interesting, to him, high-bosomed beauty as the novel continues. I'm grateful to Laura for drawing attention not only to Wharton's feminist insight, but to her humor. Wharton's pen as a reviewer was sometimes like that of the young Willa Cather, who was described as the meat ax young girl for her devastating theater reviews. Even academic critics of our own day who admire Wharton's work have too often dismissed the writing of fiction, perhaps unduly influenced by the plethora of negative criticisms that came before. Laura challenges such views, including claims that Wharton undervalued her own work as a critic or that the work is rigidly anti-modernist. Indeed, in Wharton's statement that true originality is not a new manner, but a new vision, she predicted the evolving definition of literary modernism that has occurred in scholarly criticism over the last 40 years. In her very directness, Wharton often challenges the vaguer statements of other writers and theoreticians. Fashions in the arts come and go, she writes. The best artists are those who are in some sort above fashion itself. Surely this is why we continue to read Wharton and other great writers today. What critics of the writing of fiction have repeatedly characterized as indecision in Wharton's pronouncements, Laura very correctly shows as flexibility. Wharton sharing her insight 
that although there are principles of fiction, there are no hard and fast rules. Each writer must struggle with the art for herself. I also applaud Laura's defense of the writing of fiction as a practical hands-on volume, one which is actually useful to writers, including writers today. I could say more about Laura's fine book, but I am out of time and I happily turn to Jennifer Haytock for her comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julie. First, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much to Alice and the Rothermere for hosting this event and inviting me to participate. And many thanks to Dr. Ratre for writing this book, which I very much agree with my fellow panelists is a vital contribution to Wharton studies and will change the way we think about her writing, all of her writing going forward. I'm thrilled to see Laura's work get this launch. Today, I just want to say a little bit about a point that Laura makes in her discussion of Edith Wharton genres, particularly in her discussion of the travel writing. That is, Laura notes that Wharton identifies as an American much more in that genre than we have tended to recognize in her work. Wharton's sharp critiques of Americanness most stinging perhaps in the custom of the country whose title refers to the American habit of keeping women uneducated, bored and out of the main business of life have dominated our sense of Wharton's attitude toward the United States. In many ways, Wharton seems to float free from nationality at all as a recent collection of essays on Wharton and cosmopolitanism makes clear. And yet, Laura points out that an examination across all of Wharton's genres shows that her relationship with the United States was not so simple, and that despite her professed dislike and sometimes hatred of the United States, including her oft quoted observation on her return to America as a child, how ugly it all is, Wharton never gave up on Americanness as an essential part of her identity and found uses for it in her writing. Her readership, after all, was primarily American. That Wharton remained engaged with the United States throughout her life is clear from the fiction and that she almost always took Americans as her main characters. Even in the later fiction, when Wharton was living abroad full time, her characters are all distinctly American for good or ill in such novels as A Sun at the Front, Glimpses of the Moon and The Children in which the characters spend most of their time as expatriates, as well as The Mother's Recompense and the Vance Weston novels in which characters move between the United States and Europe. What Laura adds is how much Wharton herself felt and positioned herself as an American. As a travel writer, Laura notes, Wharton frequently wrote to educate Americans positioning herself as one of them, relaying back what she found on her travels and inviting other Americans to join her. Part of this may have been just good business sense, but I think this is more than a marketing strategy. What we see from Laura's work is Wharton's direct engagement in creating an Americanness that she felt better served America's citizens. In a letter to Barrett Wendell, delayed July 19th, 1919, um, less than three weeks after the signing of the Treaty of Versailles, Wharton wrote, quote, how much longer are we going to think it necessary to be American before or in contradistinction to being cultivated, being enlightened, being humane, and having the same intellectual discipline as other civilized countries? It is really too easy a disguise for our shortcomings to dress them up as a form of patriotism. What Laura's work helps us see is that Wharton was very interested in defining a new or different form of American identity beyond what her fiction shows about how the US treats its women, but also how Americans orient themselves to others and the role of arts and the intellect in that orientation. An exception, or at least an interesting example, I think, is in Morocco, Wharton's 1920 account of her trip to North Africa three years before. 
although she does not hide her Americanness in that work, Wharton reports back for Europeans as well as Americans, positioning herself as a Westerner traveling in exotic lands among different faiths, cultures, and races. And as more than one Wharton scholar has pointed out, the native Africans are seen as exotic and othered and somehow less, and hence justify the French colonial government, and by extension, the US's imperial actions. In this work too, I think we see a complication of Wharton's Americanness. That is, her identity as she works in travel writing often shifts in opposition to the people among whom she's traveling. When she writes among, excuse me, when she writes about traveling among Europeans, she sees them as equals. And in Africa, she does not. As Laura writes, Wharton's writing about her Morocco trip suggests, quote, a sensation of dreaming and states in between wake and sleep. In Morocco, like Wharton's earlier cruise of the Vanadice, navigates between East and West, and also for Wharton, between present and past. For someone who values the past as much as Wharton did, even she found the heavy weight of the past in Morocco too much to understand. Looking at the cities and the trees, she wonders whether the people, quote, were all the ghosts of a vanished state or the actual setting of the life of some rich merchant with business connections in Liverpool. Here, she can't tell the difference between people shaped by distinct historical moments. Wharton continues, buildings, people, customs seem all about to crumble and fall of their own weight. History, instead of informing the present, here seems to overwhelm it, and in so doing overwhelms Wharton's sense of culture and identity. What I'm getting at here is really a question. I'm wondering whether in her travels to Africa, Wharton felt herself broadly Western rather than specifically American. And if perhaps she was verging on positing an Americanness that looks not only to Europe for definition by contrast, but also to Africa, not only in the sense of colonialism and empire, or even in the history of American chattel slavery, which erased enslaved persons, culture and pasts, but also in contrast or in connection with the presence of deep histories within places. What Laura and Edith Wharton and genre have sparked in my thinking is the desire to look beyond the United States and Europe to Wharton's larger engagement with non-Western people, cultures, and places as a way to think about her definition of being American. Thank you. So thank you to our panel for that wonderful um, group of responses to Laura's wonderful book. Um, we heard about her, uh, that some of the specific genres that Laura talks about, her architectural writing, her nonfiction writing, her travel writing, and how that can change uh, some of our previously held beliefs about Wharton, about her feminism, about her national identity. So what I'd like to do now is invite our audience to ask some questions. Please start putting your chat in your questions in the um, Q&A box at the bottom and we will get to them. And I'd like to invite our panel back to the screen. If you could all turn your cameras on and just to ask Laura if she's got any immediate response to some of these readings of your book, Laura. Um, well, <laughs> thank you. So, thank you so much for, for reading it and reading it so lucidly and, and wonderfully so much that I could raise there and, and with little time. but. Um, some wonderful points and points for me to take away to think about it as well. And I think uh, Emily and Julie, you're both highlighting the fact that Wharton does pay the price rather like we see her female protagonists in so many of her, her novels um, for daring to step out of line, the Italian villas and gardens that you both that you both mentioned there, where she won't just toe the line and play second fiddle to the male contributor. And it, it rankles half a century Half a lifetime later, she's still talking about it in her memoir, A Backward Glance, and she notes that the editors are so cross with her that they won't include the architectural designs, will they, in Italian villas and their gardens. So her, her 
she does pay the price for that and the authority to an extent is undermined because the reviewers are looking for those those designs and and they're not there um and as you're saying the pale imitation of male writers it still persists doesn't it Wharton as a, as a poet in particular some of those reviews are seeing her as a kind of poor man's browning and I say that as someone who loves browning but even so you know, poor man's browning with a dash of Tennyson when actually she's doing something so different in that genre and the range of, of work there and I think it was Julie who said damned if she does damned if she doesn't and absolutely throughout the career um, and I was looking at some of the town topics um, coverage there where she can't do anything right right from the the beginning she's criticized for everything for not being a, a beauty <laughs> for her writing for living in Lennox for not leaving Lennox living for leaving Lennox for going to Italy with her husband without her husband you know, anything that they can find fault with that, that they do and um, you're absolutely right Julie the, the 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 writing of fiction I think is such a core text and such a a generous volume that practical guide that's as much for um, the writer and she really looks out for younger writers and she deplores the conditions that they're under and expected to produce more and more quickly more of the same and it's um, she embraces all these forms of creativity the sempstresses the chocolatier um, and all the rest of it and I was been talking with Alice recently about her wonderful book and it was reminding me that one of Wharton's early responses to the war um, the Book of the Homeless, what does she do? This interdisciplinary reach out to all the artists in all the forms there to respond um, in a, um, in a um, humanitarian um, effort, philanthropy there. And the writing of fiction, it's, it's not an anti-modernist text. Um, and she's coming up with ideas that we might not find fashionable, but that doesn't automatically invalidate those ideas and as you're saying she starts off with the, the woman writer she reads it as part of a 300 year ta like a tapestry in, in, in the custom of the, the, the country there and um, I think that that book does need much more attention I think it's a really innovative and exciting work and it comes at a point when she's in her 60s um, people are starting to write her out and what does she do she picks up her pen and writes herself back into it. And part of the poignancy of this for me was that she could see it coming and, and she knew it was, was, was coming, that statement I made earlier about the violets and, and old lace. And, and Jennifer, absolutely, the Americanness, I, I, I think the travel writing is where we see it most clearly. And, and I do think um, less conflictedly American in that travel writing and, and I noted all we us are we Americans are America and certainly she holds up uh, uh, America and France and America is found to be wanting but still you know very much the identification there and I think sometimes we've got the balance of, of that wrong and I'm very interested in what you say about in Morocco and the western more so and I think that's a text that even though it's 1920 it's still very much steeped, isn't it, in World War I and the legacy of that. And I think that's part of, of, of the way that we, we, we see that there and, and also contributes to those kind of dreamlike states, something which Alice will know much better than I do. Uh, I think we also see in the fighting France at various points of, of the, the, narrative, the narrative there. Um, but I know we all want to have a discussion and uh, uh, speak to, to questions. So should I stop there, Alice? and see what's coming in and if any of the panelists want to come back or anything. Thank you. Well, we do have some questions coming in. So if we don't have any immediate responses, I will jump in with the first question from the audience, okay? Um, so this is a question from Lisa. Lisa says, um, it's about the writing of fiction, which is, you know, obviously provoking us, you know, we find this reading very interesting. Um, with her strong dismissal of modernist writers, such as James Joyce, Lisa says, I would argue that Wharton's text, much as she would dislike the term, has a claim on some of the innovative writing strategies or styles developed by, modern, by modernist writers. So Lisa's question is, to what extent do you see these ostensibly modernist writing techniques throughout her fictional and non-fictional work? Would you only consider later works to lay a claim on modernism or is there a sense of development? A great question there. It is. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lisa, 
for, for that. Um, I think that's Lisa in, in Aberdeen. Um, yes, I, I think we, it's a great question. And I think she, she is very much in dialogue with these writers and I'm not disputing that there are, you know, a couple of later critical pieces where she's being more blunt. But I, I think the writing of fiction, that text at that moment, 1925, and what a year of literary production, she's really at the cusp of that. But, but I would argue, Lisa, that you do see it throughout her work from as early as a, the abandoned novel Disintegration, which you know she then abandons because she's busy with a certain novel that becomes The House of, of Mirth, where she's really experimenting with um, point of view. Um, and I think you see it very clearly in the travel writing, Italian backgrounds. I argue that that's as close to a kind of modernist manifesto that you get with Wharton. It's all about parentheses and individual looking beyond forging your own path so i think we see that that there as well so um i i think and she's not going to accept things blindly this is Wharton coming up on her own terms with her own responses but we see that i would argue from beginning to end of her career i don't know what my fellow panelists think of that anyone want to come in no <laughs> jennifer <laughs> Well, you know, Laura, I think you make such a good point that the writing of fiction um, you know, it was published in 1925 and you list, you know, all the authors, you know, Fitzgerald and Hemingway's In Our Time and uh, gentlemen, um, Anita Luce, gentlemen for blondes, um, you know, which Wharton loves so much, you know, all of these texts are coming, they're appearing that same year as the writing of, of fiction. And one of the things that your book Laura really made me think about in terms of Wharton and modernism is the way in which now we are actually rethinking modernism and periodization, right? Uh, okay, of all this, well, what, what really is that? And when did it really start? And can we, can we even really nail down what it is? So there was this period where I think scholars, maybe a very brief period of time, felt that they knew specifically which writers were modernists. And of course, there were the, the men, you know, Joyce and Eliot and Faulkner and, and, and Hemingway, um, Pound. Um, and then this changes with feminist studies and other kinds of approaches to literature. So the way we think about modernism now, it's still a very nebulousy kind of term right it's very it's very mushy uh and so to a certain extent when Wharton is writing the writing of fiction yes there are the complaints so what she's saying is either too specific or not specific enough but this is always the case isn't it right you know so in some ways i think some of the criticism or responses or even some of the things she wrote we need to put into context that this is a particular time in which she's writing and everybody is rethinking writing or they're not or they're connecting it to their literary history so that's just what i wanted to throw in there okay thank you everyone so let's move on to the next question which comes from elsa i wonder if laura could speak a bit more to wharton's use of the standard for the time male he as author in writing the writing of fiction and her ability to create a female gendered authoritative voice. Thank you, Elsa, great question. And uh, I thank her in the book, Elsa read the um, architecture and design chapter for me in, 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 in draft and a great colleague. Um, yeah, it, it is fascinating, isn't it? And um, something like the travel writing, she's absolutely determined she's not gonna be the woman traveler. But I think in something like the critical writing, we are seeing a much more gendered voice and she's gunning after these guys who then in turn see her as, as Julie said with that phrase you know trespassing uh, like a trespasser on the Oxbridge lawn and some of those reviews um, were, were extraordinary you know um, I think it's J.B. Priestley um, seeing Lubbock and James doing their thing these great expeditions and Wharton making quote little ladylike trails behind them. You know, she doesn't really count. She's just there for the tea and cakes kind of thing. Um, and yet Wharton is problematic for us, isn't she? I mean, her views on Wharton, on women scholars <laughs> are not going to please anybody um, anybody on this, this panel. Um, but I would say that in the critical writing especially, she's never presenting a vision that suggests men only. Yes, she says there are rules, 
but she's also really illuminating the space and she talks about um, hybrid visions and she talks about opportunities and she believes in this combination of genius and graft which some people have real problems with that but I think she's just this is the nature of, of, of the beast and she does open it up um, to, to, to men and women and then yet she'll do this fabulous interview Emily and I spoke about this recently um, where she's really showing herself as an innovative writer talking about her playwriting and then she'll say at the end how hard work writing is and you know are women really cut out for it um which, again she goes back and plays to this this certain image but i i think in in her i don't know if i'm answering your question here elsa but in the creative in the critical writing in particular i think wharton is carving out space for the female voice in something that is perceived as a male literary terrain with that he and she. And you can see from the reviews, the critical reception, that many people really weren't happy with it. And they really went after her for that. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to come in there. I just jump in. Yeah, I think that he was so much the standard, you know, universal pronoun at that point that she's basically just following what everybody else did. Um, Willa Cather writing in the same time period is using he as the generic author the same way. Um, there's also a delightful letter by Wharton though, I'm thinking from shortly after the House of Mirth, maybe 1906, where she is writing to a, a male friend. And she says something like, it's so flattering to the author to have his favorite phrases quoted back to him and then she puts a little asterisk next to his and she says you see I'm getting a little confused about my gender um, so clearly even that universal pronoun wasn't universally universal even to Wharton um, but I think for her it was just so much the standard that it would have been seeming it would have seemed to her who was not at least consciously feminist by our standards it would have seemed very quibbling and, and picky um, I think to start messing with it. If I, if I could just piggyback on that and and, um, and say thumbs up, completely agree. But also, I, I was trained with that model. Like, I was trained, in, I hate to say it, but in, in college, <laughs> to think of the reader as he. So, so, so I think we're all products of our kind of, like, of our culture and our, our context. So, and also, I think of her as, as delighting in being called a self-made man. I always love that, you know, with Teddy Roosevelt. Like, there's something to that, the Whartons um, being taken seriously. So on to our next question, um, this is for everybody I think, if you were to add some text from these other genres to a university English curriculum, which would you choose to help students first experiencing Wharton get a more complete picture of her as an author? That's a great question from Pamela. Laura, would you like to start with that? Yeah, I'd love to. It is a great question, Pamela. So many choices. Um, I'd certainly go with Cynthia, the poem that, that Julie and I raised. Um, and you know, I remember <laughs> emailing you, Jennifer, with several exclamation marks. Oh my God, have you seen this? And we had you know, quite an email exchange uh, about that. I think that really busts quite a lot of myths about Wharton. Some of the poetry, um, I love the dramatic monologues. I think Margaret of Cortona is, is terrific and readily available that controversial poem that I, I, I mentioned. Um, and um, I'm obviously going to give a shout out to Shadow of a Doubt, which again is readily available thanks to the Edith Wharton Review. I love the way um, you get those great one-line zingers that, that Emily was, was mentioning, and nobody can do a one-liner like Wharton. You think you're getting the, the, the social setting, the lovely drawing room, and the great you know, upper, crust, upper crust situation. And then the play takes this very dark, quite dramatic turn, um, a story of euthanasia at the heart of it. And it also moves down the social scale. So that final act opens up in a boarding house in the East End of London. Um, and, and you see echoes of House of, house of Martha, of course. Um, but I think that would be a, a, a great starter to, to come in on. What do my fellow panelists think? What would you put on the books? Can I um, can I jump in the decoration of houses? I would say, um, and even perhaps, and I've done that. I, I introduced that into the curriculum for this course I designed on Wharton. Um, even if you just select chapters, I would highly recommend it because it 
there's a lot, it's really funny too. Like there, there's a lot of wit, again, I, I think of it as quite Oscar Wildean, um, but I would say um, it, it really, it complements any, any work of fiction because domestic spaces um, and public spaces are so important um, to understanding her characters. So I, I, would, I would recommend at least chapters, um, certainly the introduction, perhaps the chapters on walls and doors <laughs> in the decoration of houses. I jump back in. I would also add some excerpts from, you know, my one of my favorites, one of my many favorites, the writing of fiction. Um, I mean, especially, I mean, I have so many students who um, you know, are doing at least some creative writing. And what she says about writing fiction is so clear. And I think what she says is still so true about, you know, I mean, again, by the standards of today's literary theory, it sounds simplistic. And yet I think it's absolutely true that um, ability to create characters who seem like people. <laughs> That's what, you know, most best-selling novels today do. Um, you know, most people are not writing like Thomas Pynchon or even, dare I say it, the late Henry James. They are writing much more like Edith Wharton, trying to create good plots and good characters and really get the, the reader engrossed in the novel. Um, and she talks very directly about those things. And I think she she could still be extremely useful to creative writing students. Plus, some of the poems actually I taught some undergraduates last fall. Some of the love poems, including some of the kind of snarky love poems, and they loved all of them. I would add, I really like Emily's and Julie's ideas both, um, and and I I could see bringing in text from, from both of those. Another one I would add is pieces from Fighting France, which Laura um, really interestingly, uh, and we had conversations about this, classifies as travel writing. And I think, Laura, you make such a great case for this, for the way in which um, Wharton writes about um, her trips to the front, her, her, um, her writing, her reportage, uh, if you wanted to do that, but I think you're right that there's a great case to make for travel writing, that it fits well into that genre, but it's not like holiday travel writing, you know, to compare and contrast, you know, a section from fighting France and the devastation to the front and what it's like to be there with maybe some pieces from a motor fight a motor fight through France uh, would be a good, a, a fun thing to do, I think, with, with students and, and very illustrative. And I would absolutely do what Laura said and teach Cynthia. That poem just stuns me. And there's one, I can't actually remember the title of it, Laura. I think it's called The Rose, where the um, speaker's name turns out to be Edith and she's been cast out. So there's a number of those cast out women poems that I could also see incorporating into a number of different courses. And could I just say there's a wonderful edition of Fighting France by one Dr. Alice Kelly. Oh. All right, thank you, Laura. Next question. <laughs> um, a question, if we have time to get through these, we will. A question from Mindy. I've become deeply fascinated by Wharton's title of Hudson River Bracketed, which term she appears to have invented but not to have owned or claimed. Do you think such invention was a way of inserting herself as a woman and as a woman interested in architectural aesthetics into male-led design discussions? Any thoughts on that? I'm going to hand over to you, if I may, on that, Emily. Do you want to go with that one? Sorry, I, no, I'm going to pass it back to you. Oh, <laughs> I, I, <don't, laughs> I, I, don't I could jump in if that would be yeah. helpful. Go for um, it. <laughs> it's actually uh, an architectural term invented by a now unknown, at least to me, perhaps architectural people know him well, A.J. Downing, I think it was Andrew Jackson Downing, um, and actually Wharton explains the source in one of his books in the epigram to Hudson River Bracketed. Um, she's quoting a passage from one of his books where he says there's this style of you know architecture, that style of architecture, and the Hudson River Bracketed, um, which he defines as like some amalgamation of other styles. Um, as I understand it, it is, I mean, as the name of the style would suggest, a uniquely American style. And that's, to me, why Wharton chose it for that, because she sends that, that book in the Hudson Valley, and she's talking about um, a combination of, of issues and styles that, um, you know, culminate basically in Vance Weston and American literature. 
Great, thank you, Julie. So we have one final question, which I'm hoping we can squeeze in about the poetry. Also from Lisa, she says, how much of it was published in what form, in which journals? Um, are there any discernible reasons why the poetry remained unpublished in terms of its compatibility with the expectations of the literary market? Okay, about 27 questions <laughs> there, Lisa. I'll give it my best shot. Um, yet so much of her poetry unpublished during her lifetime, although we do get these three collections, we're really lucky that Irene Goldman Price has recently brought out an edition. So we've now got quite a lot of that um, unpublished um, poetry out there. You don't have to go into the archive and read the book stuff with poetry, as I mentioned, at the, the Lily Archive. Something like Cynthia was first published in the volume in 2005, so it's been around for 15 years, but I don't think we've really done anything um, with it, and the first time I'd seen it was, a, I had seen it was a couple of, couple of years ago. Um, poetry, you know, for Wharton was the highest form of, of literary discourse. She writes poetry almost as soon as she can pick up a pen. She turns to it in times of emotional turmoil the day Walter Berry dies she's writing a poem she writes poetry during the the, the war which becomes more complex and um, ambivalent as the war progresses and right towards the towards the end of her life um, it's published in a variety of places we've got some newspaper um, poems published fairly early on that only a child poem where she's writing to the editor of the newspaper magazine and saying Look, she doesn't know what the um, rules of English versification are, and she's put the extra syllables in on purpose. You know, Wharton uh, Young serving notice that she knows the rules and is prepared to to trans to transgress them. So, you know, a vast volume of, of, of poetry out there. And for me, I think that's going to be a major focus um, for Wharton scholarship for the next few years, at, at least. And this. Is it all great? No, but there's some terrific poetry there and the variety of, of forms there. And I think that's partly people didn't quite know what to do with that, that poetry. Um, the, the, the woman who is the writer who's praised by Longfellow at one beginning of her career, condemned by Eliot at another. She's around for such a long, a long time. I could say so much more there, there Lisa, so please get in touch. So I'm afraid we, we're going to have to wrap up. The hour went very, very quickly. And we hope our audience have enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, thank you very much to all of our panelists for their you know, very erudite contributions, their responses to Laura's book. Final thank you to Laura for writing this book. I hope it's been obvious to everybody listening how important this book is to the field of Wharton scholarship and beyond. So huge congratulations, Laura, on its publication. Thank so, you, Alice. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank yeah, you. Thank, thank you, you all for coming.